And this was just released to us a few hours ago. This video shows Kanika Jenkins walking into the kitchen, but we never see her entering the freezer. And tonight, that is why her family is not satisfied with the theory that she walked into the freezer on her own. I want to see her literally actually walking into this freezer. Kanika Jenkins' mother wants to see it to believe it, but now we know that will not happen. According to the Crown Plaza Hotel in Rosemont, there is no video of Kanika Jenkins walking into a freezer. <laughs> Mourners left the park and walked to the FBI Chicago office. They want the FBI to look into the case. Rosemont police released hours of video around the time Jenkins was at the hotel. Some of it shows her stumbling down a hallway and entering a kitchen, but she's not seen going into the freezer. The family believes there's a cover up and they want a federal investigation. Somebody in that hotel has something to do with it. She ain't just gonna let nobody hurt her. Down. We we studied her begging for help, begging for help. The police department couldn't even help us. After they found my baby dead, they couldn't even help us. The bastards! Oh, they couldn't even help us. Facebook was in a frenzy. Kanika Jenkins was born on May 27, 1998, in Chicago, Illinois, to her mother, Teresa Martin, and her father, William Jenkins. She also had a sister named Lenore Harris. They grew up on the west side in the North Lawndale area. Known for being one of the toughest and most dangerous neighborhoods in Chicago, So talk a little bit about the neighborhood that you guys come from. Yeah, it's rough. It's a jungle. It's a war zone. The biggest misconception about Chicago is that violence is everywhere. There's five neighborhoods in Chicago, five neighborhoods that you can pretty much put 90% of the violence in, that you see in those five neighborhoods. West Inglewood, Austin, Humboldt Park, Little Village, and Londale. But despite the tough environment that Kanika was raised in, she always kept a smile on her face no matter what. Friends stated that she had a very beautiful spirit and she always was upbeat and positive. Whenever she seen that one of her friends was feeling down, she would do whatever she could to cheer them up. She also had a very close relationship with her mom, Teresa. Whenever they would post videos or pictures together on social media, their love for each other was extremely obvious. Get your daughter to come get in the bed with you. When you got food, that's it. That's the only time. Look, look at it, y'all, freeloading. Only time you get your, see, Kanika. You need me. Look at her. Look at her, let them see your plate. Kanika, she was sweet. Like, if you was around her, you was sad. She not gonna let you be sad. Neil, for real. <laughs> <laughs> she was always smiling, always joyful, you know. She loved to eat. She loved to watch her Netflix. And she was real goofy, too. That shit is funny. You don't have that. Nah, it's just funny. What if you say? You can't help me, nah. What if you like? Bruh, the f. <laughs> she was full of excitement, full of joy. Man, just like an angel. Kanika was a self-proclaimed mama's girl. She attended Voice Academy High School in Chicago, and after graduating from school, she began holding down two jobs. At the age of 19, she decided to start attending nursing school. It's something that she was passionate about and had plans on making it into a career. But unfortunately, those dreams would never come to fruition because on Friday, September 8, 2017, at 11.30 p.m., a series of unfortunate events would occur that would cause Kanika's life to take a very tragic turn. She met up with her friends Monifa, Bree, and Maya. Kanika's mom allowed her to use her vehicle, and it was planned for her to be the designated driver for the night. 
They were headed to the suburb of Rosemont, Illinois, to the Crown Plaza Hotel. A friend of theirs named Irene was having a birthday party. Along with a guy that she knew who shared the same birthday, there would be multiple IG and Facebook videos with everyone in a very jovial mood, ready to party the night away. Kanika and her group of friends arrived at the Crown Plaza Hotel near O'Hara Airport at 1.13 a.m. They got on the elevator and headed to the ninth floor, room 926. Despite the room being relatively small, there was up to 31 people inside. Everybody was having a good time partying and dancing. This could be verified in an IG video that was posted online that also showed Kanika as well. And at that moment, she seemed to be sober and completely fine. At 1.30 a.m., she sent a text message to her sister, Lenore, and that would be the last time that the family would ever hear from Kanika. According to her friend, Irene, she only had one cup of Hennessy, but she noticed when they were sitting down talking, Kanika started to sway back and forth. She could tell that Kanika was a little tipsy, even though when she asked her about it, she denied it. But when she got up to walk across the room, Kanika bumped into a table and knocked over a lamp. Her friends got up to grab her to make sure that she didn't fall before she laid across the bed and dozed off. She woke up at around 3 a.m. and told her friends that she was ready to leave. Monifa and Maya were ready to go too, and they all headed out. But when they were in the hallway, Kanika noticed that she left her keys and other belongings inside. Monifa and Maya told Kanika to just stand in the hallway for one second while they went back inside to get her stuff. But when they returned to the hallway less than a minute later, there was no signs of Kanika. She was gone. Initially, they figured that she went downstairs to the hotel lobby or just went to go use the bathroom real quick. But when they checked the bathroom, she wasn't there. And when they went to the hotel lobby, nobody had seen her. Monifa and Maya headed back upstairs to room 926. Once inside, they announced to everyone at the party that they couldn't find Kanika. It's said by people who were there that the party goers kind of just shrugged off the announcement, saying that we're at a hotel, how far could she really be? According to Kanika's friend Bree, who had came to the party with the original group of girls, but decided to stay after Kanika requested to leave, she pulled Monifa and Maya to the side and questioned them about Kanika. But after having a conversation, they all agreed that she would probably show back up to the room at any second. But as the minutes continued to pass, nobody came to the door. Eventually, the three friends decided that they needed to go find Kanika and that something was wrong. Between the hours of 3.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m., they would be seen on CCTV footage, scouring the hallways of the hotel in a search for Kanika. After failing to locate her, they returned to the party, asking for help. That's when two men decided to help in the search, T.Y. and Peasy, but they still couldn't find Kanika. Now, she was really missing. On September 9th, 2017, Teresa Martin was sound asleep at her home on the west side of Chicago, trying to recover from multiple sessions of chemotherapy, attempting to fight off the breast cancer that she had been diagnosed with. But she would receive a phone call from Kanika's friend saying that they couldn't find her and that her daughter was missing. The person on the phone told Teresa that they had the keys to her vehicle, but said nothing about having Kanika's cell phone. Teresa was completely blindsided, and what she was being told didn't make any sense. She immediately hung up and called Kanika's cell phone, and that's when another friend answered, saying that she was the one that had possession of it. Teresa started to question the friends about her daughter, why they had her cell phone, and why they were driving her vehicle. She told them to bring all of Kanika's belongings to her house immediately. When they finally arrived at Kanika's mom's house, they pleaded with her saying that they didn't have anything to do with Kanika going missing and that they were sorry that all of this happened. Teresa responded to the girls by saying that she was upset because if they were all friends, they should have been looking out for one another and that they should have made sure that Kanika was safe. She also said that she wasn't blaming them directly but everybody who was in the hotel room last night was a suspect in her eyes. The girls then told Teresa that they tried to report Kanika missing to the hotel staff in the lobby, but they threatened to call the police and kick them out. After listening to what the girls had to say about the night before, Teresa would speed to Rosemont, Illinois, desperately trying to find her missing daughter. But when she arrived at the Crown Plaza, Teresa claims that she was met with a cold shoulder by the hotel staff. She told them that her daughter was missing, and the last place that she was reported was here at the Crown Plaza Hotel. 
The hotel manager responded by saying that they had no records of Kanika being a guest there, and if she's a missing person, that's considered a police matter, completely out of their control. They instructed Teresa to file a missing persons report and said that they couldn't let her see any camera footage without it and that it was against the law to do otherwise, although Teresa would later learn that this was a complete lie. And when she contacted the Rosemont PD, she was once again met with resistance. They told her that she needed to wait longer in order to file a missing persons report because Kanika was an adult and there's so many possibilities of things she could have done or places she could have went. 911, what's your address, your emergency? Yes, I'm at the Crown, uh, Crown Plaza at O'Hare Airport. And I was calling because my daughter came to, this, uh, to a party here last night, a gathering with her friends. And um, now her friends, they say that they left on the front of the hotel and she's not able to be found now. She's 19 years old. And you said that this, and, and you said the Crown Plaza at O'Hare Airport? Yes. Do you think it's possible maybe she went to one of her friends' houses or, you know, she's probably... No, be, no actually, because she had my car. She was driving my car. She know I don't like nobody to drive my car because my insurance will not pay for nobody, no one besides her. My daughter, she um, she was with three of her friends, but her three friends said, which, they, you know, these kids won't tell the truth. They said that she was, they went upstairs to get her cell phone. Her cell phone. And when they went to get her cell phone, she was standing in the lobby, in the front lobby. And then when they came back down, she wasn't there anymore. The, 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 one, the, the one issue we have, and it's not necessarily that it's that is an issue, but she is an adult. She is 19 years old. But um, what I'm saying is that, is that she, again, she's only been gone for a couple hours. She's, you know, I don't know, maybe she's, you know, she could be somewhere with one of her friends or something because I mean it, again it, it is only a couple hours since you hadn't seen her correct or since her friend supposedly hadn't seen her correct let's say about um four three to four hours now I'm so sorry Sarah. uh I just want to know is it possible that they, maybe they can look at the cameras and see um it's because they send the police out here and ask them to look at the cameras and see if um they've seen her on their cameras around that time I was about to say, uh, even if I did send an officer, it would take a little bit in order in, uh, for us to get the uh, for us to get the camera footage and us for us to pass it on to the uh, detectives division. Well, again, again, the, the only thing I would suggest maybe just um, you know g give her a couple hours. You know, she could have went. You know, she could have went somewhere with one of her other friends. I mean, and who knows what her friends are saying is true. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's you. It, they, you could tell not to be saying. You could tell it don't sound right. Teresa would be back and forth between home and the hotel all day, searching for answers about Kanika. But according to her, the hotel staff at the Crown Plaza and the Rosemont PD didn't seem really interested in helping at all. Eventually, during one of their visits to the Crown Plaza that day, Kanika's sister Lenore was finally able to get some traction at about 12.30 p.m., the Rosemont PD finally allowed her to file a missing persons report for her sister, but they told her that it couldn't be done over the phone and that she would have to come down to the police station. After filing the paperwork with the Rosemont PD, she returned to the Crown Plaza Hotel to let them know that she now had a valid missing persons report and was requesting to see the camera footage from the previous night. But they once again told her that they wouldn't be able to assist her because she didn't have a valid missing persons report number. And at that very moment, Lenore received a call from the Rosemont PD to let her know that the missing persons report that she filed was invalid because she didn't sign the paperwork. She begged the officer on the phone to come down to the Crown Plaza Hotel to offer her some kind of assistance in looking for her sister. Eventually, the officer agreed and went to the hotel. Kanika's sister repeatedly requested that he check the video camera footage from the night that she went missing. She stated that he went inside of the office for all of five minutes before coming out of the room and saying that there was no footage of Kanika ever entering or exiting the hotel. Lenore knew that this wasn't true, but her only choice was to accept the information that she was given. As she was leaving the hotel, she called her mom and told her what the officer said. After receiving that news, Teresa returned to the Crown Plaza at about 5 p.m., and this time she wasn't taking no for an answer. She wasn't asking the hotel staff for help. 
She decided to take matters into her own hands, and she wasn't alone. Along with her daughter Lenore came Irene, whose party was held the night before that Kanika attended. She was there to help with the search, along with T.Y. and Peasy, who had also helped to look for Kanika the night before. They started on the ninth floor, going room to room, banging on the doors, asking people had they seen Kanika. The hotel staff told them that they were disturbing the peace and that if they continued, they would have to call the cops. The search party ignored the hotel staff's request and continued to go down each floor banging on room doors trying to get information about Kanika. Eventually, the police showed up and gathered everybody in the lobby trying to get to the bottom of what was going on. Teresa explained to the officers that she had been coming back and forth to the hotel all day trying to get information about her missing daughter. But according to the people that were there, the officers didn't seem too interested in Kanika being missing. They were treating them like they had done something wrong and like they were the suspects. They began to ask them did they have records and hadn't they been arrested before in Rosemont. That's when Teresa said why isn't the focus being put on finding her missing daughter? Why are they the ones being questioned? And that's when the police started to ask them questions about Kanika, like her appearance, her height, the clothing that she had on on the night of her disappearance. According to Irene, there was an individual in the hotel lobby at the time of all of the commotion, a trans woman who claimed to have seen Kanika the night before at the lower level of the hotel with a group of men. But according to Irene, the police completely ignored her and act like they didn't hear anything that she said. This individual was verified to be at the hotel around the time of Kanika's disappearance. They were captured on CCTV footage. After getting information about Kanika from family and friends, the cops told them that they had to leave the hotel, but that they would search the premises and told Teresa that they would update her if they found anything. And just three hours later, Teresa would get a phone call that would change her life forever. It was the Rosemont Police Department letting her know that they had just found her daughter at the lower level of the hotel dead inside of a freezer. It said that she was found by two officers at 12.30 a.m. She had trouble processing what the officer was telling her. It just didn't make any sense. When Teresa arrived back at the hotel, she asked the detective in charge would it be okay if she seen her daughter. And the detective replied by saying yes, it would be okay. But hours would go by and Teresa wouldn't hear anything else until a sergeant walked inside of the office and told Teresa that she wouldn't be able to see her daughter because it was against protocol. She claimed that he was very rude and wasn't helpful at all. After he told her she wouldn't be able to see her daughter, Teresa asked for his name and his badge number, which made him feel away. After that, he agreed to let her see her daughter's body, but said that he had to talk to the coroner first to make sure that it was okay. Another five hours would pass before Teresa would get word that it was okay for her to go see her daughter, but it came with restrictions. Telling her that she could only bring one other person, she couldn't take any pictures, and she couldn't touch anything because it was an active crime scene. As soon as Teresa walked inside of the kitchen area, she immediately broke down. Although she didn't directly see her daughter, she did see the white body bag on the stretcher, and that was enough to send her into hysteria. That moment would be captured on hotel security footage, followed by the cops on scene, who don't seem too sure of what to do or what to say to the grieving mother. After regaining her composure, she asked the detectives could she at least look at the crime scene to try to understand what happened to her daughter. They told Teresa that it was an open and shut case. Kanika was intoxicated. She stumbled to the freezer and accidentally locked herself inside. There was no signs of her being taken advantage of in any way so it would be ruled an accidental death. He did tell her that one of Kanika's shoes was off, and she did have a few scratch marks on her body. He said that her taking the shoe off was a side effect of hypothermia, and the scratch marks probably came from her bumping up against the wall while intoxicated walking through the hotel. But Teresa was well aware that hypothermia side effects would cause a person to take off all of their clothing, not just one shoe. When she entered the freezer where Kanika was found, she noticed that the door locked from the outside. Plus, there was a white lever inside of the freezer that she could have pushed that would have simply opened the door. So she felt there was no way that her daughter actually locked herself inside. Something else happened. Then she started asking questions about the camera that was above the freezer that Kanika allegedly walked into on her own. The detective responded by saying that this particular camera wasn't on during that time. 
Teresa stated that it seemed like the more questions she asked about the crime scene, the more frustrated the officers on scene got. It didn't seem like she was getting treated like a grieving mother. She was getting treated like a suspect and didn't understand why they decided not to take fingerprints. Teresa stated that she found it odd that law enforcement was trying to close the case immediately, as well as determining the cause of death and accident on scene without doing a proper autopsy. She left the hotel that day still cloudy surrounding the information of what happened. The only thing she knew for certain is that she had lost her daughter and she was desperate to know why. So she decided to go to the only place where she felt like she had a voice, social media. She made numerous IG Live videos and Facebook posts demanding justice for her daughter. Her posts would get thousands of likes, shares, and retweets, and the story started to pick up steam on the internet. Celebrities, blog sites, and major news outlets began to report on the mysterious death of Kanika Jenkins. The big question, how did Kanika Jenkins wind up in a freezer? CBS 2 Sandra Torres is live at the Rosemont Police Station tonight. But the death over the weekend of 19-year-old Kanika Jenkins is casting a long shadow over the town's good news. Obviously a, a tragedy, this 19-year-old gal has lost her life. After Jenkins was discovered missing after attending a birthday party on the ninth floor of the Crown Plaza Hotel late Friday night, her body was discovered early Sunday morning in a freezer in the basement of the hotel. Her mother was hoping that all of the news coverage would help bring justice for her daughter. Dozens of protests would take place in Chicago, demanding for Kanika's case to be reopened. And during this time, she would receive an ally, a man named Andrew Holmes. She stated that she had never met him before, but when he introduced himself, he said that he was a part of the Chicago PD special unit and that he was there to help her get answers about her daughter's death. He presented himself as an ally, and in her vulnerable state, Teresa was willing to take any help that she could get in regards to her daughter. She went to a meeting at the Rosemont Police Department about keeping her daughter's case open. Teresa was accompanied by her lawyer, but she said for some reason, the sergeant at the meeting found it very disrespectful that she came with legal counsel. She left that meeting making no progress in her daughter's case. A day later, she would once again be contacted by the Rosemont PD. They told Teresa that they needed Kanika's cell phone in order to look through it for possible evidence. She also claims that they told her that they had the video of Kanika walking inside of the freezer, but she would have to come down to the police station in order to view it, and she had to come by herself, no lawyers. Teresa said that she didn't feel comfortable doing that, and they told her that she wouldn't be able to view the video of her daughter. That's when Andrew Holmes stepped in and said that he would go down to the Rosemont PD on her behalf. Not too long after this interaction, she would receive another phone call from Andrew Holmes, saying that he had just watched the video of Kanika walking inside of the freezer and it was simply an accident. He then told her that she needed to get online and report this new information so all of the protesting would stop because the hotel was starting to lose a lot of money. Teresa stated at that very moment she knew she could no longer trust Alex as an ally, and even though initially she would reject his request to call for an end to the protest, eventually she would agree and call for an end due to the fact that she didn't want any violence to take place between the protesters and the police. Andrew Holmes called my phone. He told me to get on. He said what you should do is get on laugh and make a um a laugh and tell him that um you saw the camera of Kanika walking into the freezer. He said, because the hotel is not making no money. They want us to stop this. They want us to stop. They want it to stop. Me looking at the video, she was trying to find her way back upstairs to the lobby. And she was checking the doors and she was checking other doors, just trying to find her way back upstairs. So in saying that, she was walking forward where all of the video cameras caught her every movement, and I watched her as she went through the other door, and at the same time, she went through an unsecured area. Not to mention the multiple people that came to her presenting themselves as community leaders. Without Teresa's knowledge, they would set up donation accounts under Kanika's name, then pocketing all of the money and leaving the people who donated feeling scammed. Teresa stated that she never told anyone to take money on her behalf, and the only thing she was ever concerned with was justice for her daughter. 
but it wasn't clear if that would be possible. The more footage that came out from the hotel that night, the more conspiracy theories grew. There were so many different characters and so many potential suspects. There was video of different unidentified security guards that was at the hotel the night of Kanika's disappearance. And according to those who have studied the Kanika Jenkins case, it's the actions that they were caught on security footage doing. One security guard was caught sprinting through the halls around the time of Kanika's disappearance. He seemed to be in a very frustrated state, and it's not very clear exactly what the issue was, and the hotel had no record of any incidents being reported. Another security guard was caught going room to room. It seems as if he was trying to open the door, but he had towels in his hand as if he was trying to give them to the guests. Some people pointed out that it seemed odd for a security guard to be the one giving out towels when that's usually a housekeeping job. Along with the fact that there was multiple reviews of people saying that a strange man tried to enter their room at night. One individual claims that the hotel gave this person described as the strange man a key to every room in the hotel. A number of videos begin to show up on YouTube of internet detectives pointing out clues in the security footage of the Kanika Jenkins case. Some people believe that there was a hand that reached out for Kanika as she was going around the corner in one of the hallways on the CCTV footage, while others stated that it wasn't Kanika at all and that the video wasn't even real and that it was just a cover-up for something much more larger and sinister that was going on. But what can be verified with 100% certainty is that Kanika Jenkins was seen on security footage, looking as if she was in a sedated state, stumbling through the hallways trying to find her way, as if she was inside of a maze that she couldn't figure out or escape. There would also be another individual added to the list of potential suspects and suspicious characters. Videos on the internet would refer to him as the morgue guy because he was seen handling the body in the kitchen with the police. But when everyone left the room, he would turn to the camera, staring at it in a very ominous and some would say suspicious manner. And what makes this individual even more interesting is that he would later be arrested with someone else who was connected with the case. The trans individual who was trying to talk to the police on the night that they were questioning Kanika's mom when she was trying to tell the officers that she seen Kanika on the bottom floor with a group of guys, but was completely ignored. The charges that they were arrested for was unrelated to the Kanika Jenkins case, but, but people still found the connection to be extremely odd. One of the most infamous pieces of evidence was an Instagram Live video taken by her friend Irene. But this theory would quickly be disproven because that IG Live video was taken before the one that showed Kanika at the party, seemingly completely sober and okay. Conspiracy theorists would say that if you listen closely, you could hear Kanika screaming in the background before Irene turns up the music to drown out her voice. The Crown Plaza would offer to pay for Kanika's funeral, but her mom said she had to turn it down because they never formally apologized, and she didn't believe that they really even cared. After Kanika's autopsy was complete, it stated that she passed away from accidental hypothermia, but it was also discovered that she had a substance in her system called Teparamate. It's used to treat epilepsy and seizures, but it's also known to increase the effects of alcohol and hypothermia. But this was odd, because people who were at the hotel claimed that they never seen Kanika partake in any party substances. In December of 2018, Teresa Martin would file a $50 million wrongful death lawsuit against the Crown Plaza Hotel. The widespread media coverage that the Kanika Jenkins case received was highly unusual. During a time where thousands of young black girls go missing every day and it's underreported, if it's reported at all. But Kanika's case got a lot of attention, although in spite of this attention, to many people whatever happened at the Crown Plaza on that night remains an unsolved mystery. But despite the uncertainty surrounding the case, internet conspiracies continue to run wild. White hoodie, blue jacket, he could see Kanika through this little window right here. This window 
supposedly also has a purse in it in, and that's why it's black right there. The now, Kanika is going to walk in this door and you're going to see him look for her just a little bit. And once he see her get to this point, he going to turn his face back straight. Like he wasn't looking. Like he wasn't looking. Very closely. Oh. Boom, right there. Play it again. You can see, she don't got five arms. Watch yeah. that shit. Boom. Somebody pull her time, back. And play it in full time. I'm gonna keep looping it so you can see the hand. See the hand? Go back. Watch the hand. Watch the hand, try to grab her. See it? Kanika's mom promised that she would continue to fight for justice when it came to her daughter. Although according to the Rosemont PD, it was simply an unfortunate and tragic accident, and the case was officially closed. But one man would take an interest in this case, and that interest would peak almost to the point of obsession. And his decision to get involved would set off a chain of events that could only be described as the domino effect. When one incident occurs, and it sets off a series of similar and related events, Zachary Stoner, AKA Zach TV was born on March 25th, 1990. He came up in the Goontown area of Chicago, 105 MMG. In July of 2009, he would publish his very first video on YouTube, just showing him and his guys in Goontown chilling on the block. Hey, hey, in Goon Squad. Hey, okay, okay. on the beach, I'm gonna go. He didn't have much direction with his camera at this point, he was just recording. But in two short years from that point, Zack TV would find his purpose. He decided that he wanted to put a positive spotlight on his city and he began to interview up and coming rappers. He wanted to show that it was more to Chicago than just gangs and violence. There was real talent in the city, and Zack TV was determined to use his platform to put it on display. This was the beginning of the drill music movement, something that was sweeping through Chicago. It would take over America, and eventually the whole world. Zack TV played a major part in that happening, going to some of the most dangerous hoods in the city, interviewing their top talent about their plans in the rap game. He was a pioneer in the street interview genre that will go on to take over YouTube and other social media platforms. He was actually the very first person to interview a very young Chief Keith, right around the time that he was just starting to get buzzed from his viral hit single, I Don't Like. He interviewed some of the most well-known individuals from the early Chicago drill era, people like L.A. Capone and Rondo No. 9, as well as Little Dirk's cousin O.T.F. Newski. Shooter Shells from Black Mob, FBG Duck, and many others. He knew that his job was dangerous and the hazards that came along with doing interviews in different hoods. But he felt like it was worth it. He was trying to put the city on his back. Zach's message was always positivity. He would volunteer down at the local juvenile detention center, talking to troubled kids, trying to get them on the right track. He was on a mission for peace in the city. And whenever you seen him in a photo, he was always throwing up two fingers to represent just that, peace. Yeah. Why do you have so many followers? What do you think? What is the reason for that on, 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 on in social media? Why do I have so many followers? Because um, I think I'm the hood seeing it. A, a media mogul, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What I'm doing, nobody ever accomplished. Just a few people that did it, but yeah. they got up, you know what I'm saying? It's crazy. It's That's so a true. dangerous. It's a dangerous situation, a dangerous job. <laughs> your mom gotta be like, your mom gotta be like praying for you every day. Yeah, she don't follow to... me on social media. I blocked her so she don't see mm -hmm. half of the shit. Yeah, show. I'm just hearing you talking. I'm like, man, your mom gotta be like, keep him safe, please. Yeah, you know, you she know, gotta be worried. A lot of people pray. pray That's for crazy, me. man. Our job is to entertain them, not to be in beef with one another. You feel me? Like, I don't understand. I don't think y'all seeing the real purpose, man. I love everybody out there. I love y'all. I don't got no ops. The ops is any mother trying to take me from my freedom, take my family away from me, and come between my money. Man, I'm going to wish y'all much success, man. Stay blessed. As Zach TV's YouTube channel continued to garner hundreds of thousands of subscribers and millions of views on videos, he wanted to expand his platform and his journalistic range. He became very interested in the story of Kanika Jenkins. He felt like it was very suspicious, and there was something hiding in the dark that he wanted to bring to the light. 
The more information that he obtained about the case, the more invested he became. He would spend countless hours on the internet deep diving searching for information, watching hours of footage, listening to multiple tapes, looking for any information that could possibly help solve the case of Kanika Jenkins. He would go on to interview multiple people who were there the night that Kanika mysteriously ended up in the freezer. Although many people felt like there was inconsistencies in their story, one thing that they all agreed on is that they felt like the Crown Plaza had something to do with it. They said that it had a very eerie vibe, something that was echoed in previous reviews left by people who stayed at the hotel but said that they remember it having a very strange and dark energy. Somebody in that hotel had some loot in it. She ain't just gonna let nobody hurt her. Who would have attacked Kanika? Mark Jenkins. Hard was the creepy security dude. I think they harmed Do you think someone that was in the hotel harmed Kanika Jenkins? Yeah, I think so. I really deeply in my heart think so. Dude, I don't say I'm here good times. And it's just the hotel family is here, bro. Like, I, that's what I was just gonna say. Yeah, it's like, just, it's like, just okay. Right, bro. It's like, okay, everybody's seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre, man. Everybody's seen Texas right. Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> in that movie, you learned the mama was in it, uncle was in it, the cop, he was in it, right. everybody was in it. How did she end up in the freezer? You got any thoughts on that? I don't know what to think about that. I know she ain't put herself in the freezer, though. A lot of speculation still surrounded Kanika's friends who were with her on the night that she died. There was a story going around about a $200 debt that Kanika allegedly owed to Monifa. And when she refused to pay, her friends decided to set her up. They went to social media and aggressively denied the claims. Monifa stated that she would never set up her best friend over $200, but people also wondered what she was doing on security footage on the night of Kanika's death, looking like she was trying to get in at different doors using a master key. People also wondered why Irene could be seen on the camera footage leaving the hotel not too long after Kanika was reported missing and found it odd that she didn't help in the initial search. Zach vowed that he would solve the case of Kanika Jenkins. He was going to dedicate his platform and all of his resources to do so, and he was going to expose everyone involved. He went on Instagram Live multiple times threatening to expose the truth and everything that he knows. Really, really hear me out. And y'all can rate y'all comments in the bottom, and we're going to talk. We're going to talk tonight i ain't going to sleep until like i figured the case out on a plane i was putting two and two together i was ringing, i was looking at show my laptop i was looking at evidence videos from interviews so can they could leave while monifa and them is in there grabbing a phone and their keys she leave with the employee either way it go whether they told her to leave out the hallway or they took her to the washroom. Either way it go, it shows Kanika was encountered by an employee. So when people was like, damn, she was in the kitchen and it looked like somebody was telling her come this way, they was probably down in the kitchen telling her the washroom is that way, go straight. Or the washroom is this way. You understand what I'm saying? The security controls the camera settings and all that. They edited everything. That's why when the mother came back and said, um, my daughter's missing, let's see the tape all oh, week. It's not working because they needed time. They needed to stall until they edit them tapes. You feel me? They didn't want to get a, They don't want to release that footage with their face in the picture. I think someone in that hotel killed her and tried to cover it up. But soon, Zach TV would start to get the feeling that maybe he was in too deep. Those same Instagram live videos where he was speaking about the Kanika Jenkins case would start to get interrupted by mysterious callers. Some people claimed that the calls were fake and that they were all staged, but from the change in Zach TV's demeanor, it seemed to be very real. Zach said that he was also receiving mysterious calls while at home in the middle of the night. His home was broken into as well and a computer was stolen. Things were getting too real, it was too much going on, so Zach made the decision to completely leave the Kanika Jenkins case alone. But unfortunately for Zach, he may have made the decision to leave the case alone too late.
powerful interviews. I really, really, really want to drop them and leave this shit alone. But my life been threatened numerous times. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't drop shit if you drop it. You put the hotel in danger. All type of other shit. I don't even talk about it. I just stay with the rappers now. But should I just drop it and say fuck what everybody got to say? Yes or no? Leave the case alone. Leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to take your advice. Leave it alone for your safety. Wow. Leave it alone. But you you scaring me. But I'm saying, Zach, it's deeper than what we think it is. And they want us to step back. That's why the police, the FBI, none of them have stepped in. Because they're connected. Open your eyes and stay prayerful. I'm serious. Open your eyes. And stay prayerful. So, you so you saying do not? So I should never talk about the case again. Don't put. Don't, sh don't even go into it because they're watching you. You have a an account. You have an account that they're watching you. If you look into Joel Coma, you will stop. Okay. So, that the. Okay, I'm gonna fall back from the case, ma'am. You know, I, I haven't been posting anything on Facebook. Somebody super close, cause she knew too much. My nigga, she started naming names. She told me Zach, be careful, cause such and such on this. And she she told me write down names. Yo, names, my nigga. Like this, the biggest break ever. I don't want no parts in this. I don't want. I'm done. It's getting, it's getting spooky. It's getting crazy. Every second is some new information. Every other day is some other shit going on with it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Like, a lot of people told me plenty of times before to leave this, lead, lead this case alone. Finish getting my money and go on with life. That has nothing to do with Zach. Leave it alone. You understand what I'm saying? Numerous times. Like, like a thousand times. Niggas on the street. People in the industry, people that's connected. Everybody was telling me to just leave it alone. <laughs> How you get my number? She, she didn't want to answer that. She kept saying from Twitter. You didn't get it from Twitter. My shit's not on Twitter. Once again, you understand what I'm saying? Second, she say, she say, hold up. I don't want them to trace my number. Mind you, she already called me private. So she hang up and called my other phone. Your word. She called this phone. I don't know how the fuck she got this number. I had this phone for like two months, my nigga. That's personal. That's for family only. That scared me. Zach felt that he was making the right decision leaving the Kanika Jenkins case behind. But he was already in too deep and time was running out. Because on May 30th, 2018, at around 1.30 a.m., just moments after leaving the Refuge nightclub, Zach TV would be shot and killed in the Printers Row neighborhood. The death of Zach TV left the city of Chicago in shock. Rumors began to fly that a man named T Street set up Zach TV. He was a part of the Young Money Gang in Chicago, with its most famous member being 051 Melly. Not only that, it's also said that he was one of the passengers that was with Zach TV on the night that he died and returned fire at his attackers. Just two weeks prior to his death, Zach TV did an interview with T Streets, and they seemed real cool. He was desperate to proclaim his innocence, and he broadcast from a Chicago precinct. He heard the rumblings of law enforcement trying to connect him to the case. He would take to social media calling all of the rumors lies, stating that him and Zach TV were friends, and he had no reason to bring harm his way. Yeah, hell yeah, I got it on the line. Just, yeah, I'm walking in here. I ain't duck. Yeah, I'm up here in District 5 Cause it's tweaking Oh yeah, you know it's fuck these niggas, man I ain't worried about these niggas It's just They got the police coming knocking on my door Cause these goofy ass bloggers Wanna keep on putting my name in shit, man Like they know what the fuck going on But on June 8th 
2018, T Streets would lose his life in the exact same way as Zach TV, shot to death inside of his vehicle. Before Zach TV passed away, he had done a lot of research and gathered a lot of information in regards to the Kanika Jenkins case. He started working with a man named Jonathan Jackson, AKA J Money, Kanika's uncle. They were both outspoken advocates demanding justice for Kanika. He was seen on surveillance footage talking to security on the night that Kanika was missing. He was also spotted in the kitchen area, the last place that Kanika was seen alive, walking back and forth, looking as if he was searching for clues or some type of evidence. But in March of 2018, he would meet his demise in a very similar fashion as Zach TV, shot to death inside of his vehicle. People on social media began to post about how suspicious these deaths seemed, and somehow they were all connected to the Kanika Jenkins case. Others would dismiss these claims as conspiracy theories, but soon there would be another victim added surrounding this mysterious case, a man named Stephen Ward, AKA OTE Head, who just like Zach TV, had took a keen interest in the Kanika Jenkins story. He became one of the most outspoken people online demanding justice. The pictures though, if they feel like, like I made a post like case closed, hell no. And I, I, I showed y'all the news thing too from WGN, that's Chicago, actual news. Like that was an actual live news thing that I posted on my page. So they saying that the case closed because they released these pictures. But y'all still forgot one key element. We still don't got the camera though. Like where's this footage that Andrew Holmes saw? You know what I'm saying? He would be on Facebook and Instagram live for hours upon hours talking about the case and everything that he knew about it, vowing to expose the truth and finally get injustice for Kanika. But before that could happen, OTE Head would meet the same demise as the other three men, shot multiple times inside of his vehicle. It's been said that it was simply street business that led to his unfortunate demise and that it had absolutely nothing to do with his involvement in the Kanika Jenkins case. But some people believe that it is all connected and that the four men who lost their lives in similar fashion was all orchestrated hits and that a powerful entity in the darkness was responsible for it all to make sure that the truth never came to light. Five men were arrested for the murder of Zach TV, ages 19 to 23. But despite having witnesses and video of the assailants running from Zach TV's vehicle, the Cook County District Attorney decided to drop all charges based on a state law called mutual combatants, meaning when two or more parties agree to meet up to fight or partake in any type of violence, the results go without consequence. So despite the overwhelming evidence, all five men would be released. One of the most controversial theories in the Kanika Jenkins story is the connection to pop singer Selena Gomez. In 2017, while she was visiting pop superstar The Weeknd in Chicago, she had a medical emergency and it was discovered that her kidneys were failing. She would need to have a transplant immediately in order to save her life. And that's exactly what happened. What made people start to connect her and Kanika Jenkins is that she had her surgery done in Chicago and she received her kidney transplant just days after Kanika was found in the freezer. Speculation began to circulate that it was all a part of an underworld market scheme and that Kanika's life was sacrificed in order to save a celebrity. These claims would quickly be dismissed by naysayers due to the fact that it was public knowledge that a woman named Francia Reza was the kidney donor. She was close friends with Selena and they did numerous interviews together recounting their journey. It seems like it would be sufficient evidence to dismiss this theory, but there are those that believe, and this can be confirmed by the numerous videos on YouTube covering the subject. In 2023, after six years, Teresa Martin would finally settle her lawsuit against the Crown Plaza Hotel. The details of the settlement was sealed, and the amount given was undisclosed. People on social media started to call Teresa out, claiming that instead of continuing to seek justice for her daughter, she settled for a check. Not understanding all of the years of hurt, despair, and uncertainty not knowing what happened to her daughter, she took to IG Live to address those speaking negative on her name. Hey YouTube, 
I didn't know that you can report, block, and delete so fast on YouTube. I like YouTube better than all the channels, all the, all the internet things. It ain't nothing no one can say to me that can hurt me more than me losing my child. Mm. So everything they, they saying is irrelevant. Well, Throughout the years, this case has continued to captivate the public's attention. BET, CNN, and Inside Edition have all done special reports about it. MTV even did a true crime documentary surrounding the case. It's a Chicago mystery that has reached urban legend status. But this isn't a movie, and it isn't a fictional character like Candyman. This is a true story, real life, and a series of unfortunate events caused a young lady to lose hers. She had the world in the palm of her hands with her whole life ahead of her, and it was tragically and mysteriously all taken away from her. And Kanika Jenkins, she was only 19 years old when she died. Rest in peace, queen.